Good morning, welcome to the gathering. It's good to see you. Would you stand with us as you're able and go hug somebody? Tell me you love them as we start to worship this morning.
Good to see your uh, smiling faces out there today. Happy Memorial Day weekend. Everybody glad to be in uh, the house of the Lord this morning? Everybody glad to be here this morning? Woo, we got some energy. How many people would rather be at the beach today? I know Lisa would rather be at the beach. That's all she could talk about this morning is uh, being at the beach. We are excited to have, uh, this is one of our bicentennial uh, Sundays, we're excited to have Reed Shell. He is uh, the brother of Becky Smith, who uh, usually sits over there on our front row. But today she's sitting here on our front row. Uh, Reed, I left all my notes down in the sanctuary, so I'm going to go off the top of my head. Uh, Reed and Becky grew up here at Keith, so uh, he is a product of Keith uh, Church. He is a product of uh, Keith Methodist, grew up here. Uh, it was not an option of them coming to church. Uh, they didn't get a vote on uh, Sunday mornings of whether they wanted to come to church. They came to church. It, it uh, just was a part of something that they did. And Reed will share some of his favorite memories uh, in the sermon time. Uh, Reed has been um, a product of Emory and Henry, which is one of our conference colleges, a graduate of Candler Theology in uh, Atlanta, has been a pastor in Holston 44 years, 47 years, a uh, district superintendent, and is now retired in that role, uh, lives in Lenore City. And uh, with his wife, Kathy, and uh, we are excited about having Reed uh, with us. Uh, his family is excited about having him with us today. So, Reed, we welcome you. Thanks for being with us today. Uh, as we come to a time of prayer this morning, uh, what are some concerns that we can lift up this morning as uh, we worship together? Some concerns. I know I heard from uh, Joe Mitchell this morning, his sister, uh, Joanne Polivka. Uh, we've been praying for her for a long time. Uh, she had had dementia for a long time. She died either last night or this morning. Uh, so I told Joe and Cindy that we'd be uh, praying for her this morning. Honey, you had one. Absolutely. Uh, Carol Poe. Um, she is struggling with pancreatic cancer, has been in the hospital this week uh, struggling with a, a gallbladder issue, uh, expected hopefully to go home either today or tomorrow, and uh, will be uh, hopefully going to Vanderbilt later on this week, uh, maybe on Thursday, to, uh, to get some further uh, second opinion on some things. So... Uh, Praying for Chuck and for Carol would, would be great. Uh, we're also praying for Graham and Audrey Archer. If you know Graham and Audrey, um, Graham helped bring soccer to Athens when uh, soccer um, was, was started here. Uh, there was a lot of people who didn't know what soccer or how to organize soccer or what to do. Uh, Graham is British and is a lover of soccer. And uh, tried to, to help Athens get organized and fall in love with soccer community. So uh, Graham is in, on hospice care uh, right now, struggling with bone cancer. So if you would uh, be in prayer for uh, Graham and Audrey, I know that they would appreciate that. Are there other concerns? Heather? Joey Allen, and uh, Joey Allen passed away last week, 
and uh, his daughter Willow, uh, who is 16, 17, 16, and um, just uh, as you know, a 16-year-old with uh, losing a father would would be difficult. So uh, pray for pray for her. Yes. Absolutely, Patricia. Thank you uh, for reminding me of that. Um, if you'd give me a, a minute of a privilege to say something about that. Uh, Patricia uh, had asked us to pray for uh, our church, Keith Church, and uh, the Methodist Church. Um, I wrote a newsletter article uh, last week, and somebody asked me if I wrote it when I was mad. <laughs> I wrote it when I was serious, y'all. Uh, I wrote it when, when I wanted to get serious about things, and I wrote it to, uh, to ask our congregation to get our perspectives right, you know, to, to get our perspective focused on ministry and mission and not on when are we going to take a vote to disassociate? When are we going to take a vote to leave the Methodist Church? Because that's all I hear is when are we going to take a vote? Um, the simple answer is the conference trustees are still working on a plan. They have developed a plan that they will give us later in June. And uh, we will take a vote as a congregation when we have that plan revealed. You will have plenty of notice uh, when, we, when we take a vote. Uh, I expect that later in the summer we'll, we'll take a vote as a congregation on whether we stay a United Methodist Church or whether we uh, don't stay a United Methodist Church, whether we disassociate or um, uh, what's the new term? Um, disaffiliate, disassociate is the new term. Um, we'll take a congregation vote on that uh, later this summer. Um, we will give you plenty of notice. Everybody will have a chance to come and uh, give their vote. If you're a, a member of the church, you are entitled to, to give that vote. Uh, we will give you ample opportunity uh, to do that. So I will let you know when that vote is taking place. Friends, church family, my heart has been very heavy as I've been in prayer and in thought for our church, knowing and understanding for years that this decision would be something that would divide us. I'm a sinner. Is anyone in here not? These doors are open for me. These doors are open for you. They're open for us. I didn't grow up a Methodist. I found the Methodist church because I saw God's love in every community that I have served in, that I have lived in, more than any other denomination, I saw God's love in action in the community. That's what brought me in to the United Methodist Church. I love this church. I love Keith. I love you. I don't want to lose any one of you. I don't want to walk out those doors. I want us to stay together, to stay affiliated. I want us to remain open doors and open hearts for all sinners. This is a place where we can come, where we can worship, and we can grow in our faith and our discipleship. Our church is growing. This church is growing. Do you know how hard that is to accomplish nowadays? We are on good, solid foundation at Keith because we're together. Before your article, I heard rumors and rumblings of a coup d'etat. There are members of our church 
that are talking about disaffiliation, about leaving, about not staying together. And that hurts my heart. I have to think, as I remind myself day in and day out, is what I'm acting, is what I'm saying, is what I'm doing in love? And is it in kindness? I want everybody to really pray and think hard on that. You have convictions and I have convictions, and those convictions aren't going to be the same. And that's okay. That's okay. Please, let's think hard about this. I'm a United Methodist because that's where God brought me. That's where I see God's love at. And it was specifically to this church. And I'll say, to the best of my knowledge, the folks that are talking about disaffiliation... I want you to look at the families with children in here. They're not part of that conversation. We're not part of that conversation. And that's not right. We will have a chance to have this conversation as a body, a unified body. Let's take our time and deeply consider this and consider the future of Keith and what we are doing, let's ask, is it in love and is it in kindness? Thank you. Friends, we've got a lot to pray for. As you see, our our church is divided. We've got a lot to pray for. Uh, We have a church council meeting where we will hear uh, both from a group uh, that is wanting to disaffiliate that is wanting to disassociate, and a group that is wanting to stay United Methodist. We will hear from both sides on Wednesday night in this room. So uh, you are welcome to come and uh, to hear uh, at that church council meeting Wednesday night. Um, There will be no voting that will be taking place. It's just um, an official uh, church council meeting. The voting will happen later this summer. But as uh, Patricia has, has asked us to do, would you uh, just be in prayer for Keith? Would you be in prayer for the Methodist Church? Are there other concerns that we can be in prayer for this morning? Are there joys that we can lift up? Amen. We're so glad that uh, clean and shiny and nothing is found. (laughs) That's wonderful. TMI, but that is good. (laughs) That is wonderful. That is wonderful. Marcus. Very cool. Marcus's son is now officially engaged. How many of you all uh, follow the conference newspaper, The Call, uh, online or on email? Uh, We will share it on the Facebook page when we get it. But the Treehouse Project will be featured. Henry's Treehouse is what we should call it, right, Henry? Henry? He's not sharing it. It's the Winter's Treehouse, but we should call it Henry's Treehouse. will be featured in an article tomorrow. Uh, it'll be coming out. Uh, Marcus uh, has, has kind of spearheaded the United Methodist men 
has done a wonderful job on Henry's Treehouse. And uh, they have interviewed Diane and Marcus and Mark and myself for this project. And the article will come out tomorrow. And uh, we give God thanks, Diane, for uh, what God has done through that. And uh, give God thanks, Marcus, for how, uh, how you began that project. So I uh, look forward to, to sharing that and uh, what God will do through that for sure. That is a, that is a praise. Yeah, Heather, 27 years. Yeah. And you all always celebrate that on the golf course, of course, right? <laughs> always at the golf course. <laughs> Congratulations. Great niece born on Friday to run this family. All right. All the way in the back. You can land the backflip. All right. How many of you all want to see the consistently landed backflip? How many of y'all want to see it? You think we should do it? Come up here and show us that you can consistently land the backflip. Because you know, he says it, but until we see it. All right. On the count of three, y'all got to help me count. All right. One, two, three. Yeah, he did it, man. That is awesome. Yes, yes, what a joy, man. That is awesome, yes. All right, Nat. This week, 21 years. That's nice. Nat's parents, 21 years. That's great. Nat, you'll have to do something special for him. <laughs> Mike, you'll have to come up with something that, you know, that Mia will love, that, <laughs> that you'll have to cook something that you and Mia will love. <laughs> yeah, 21 years, 21 years, that's great, man. <laughs> Congratulations, man, that's great. Any other joys that we can celebrate? Let's go to God in prayer using our breath prayer. If we can put that up on the screen. If you would join me in these words. Almighty God, we surrender our lives and our church to you. Renew our hearts with empathy, humility, and curiosity so all may be transformed by your love. God, we know you can and you will. Amen. May we pray together. God, we know you can and we trust that you will. So in our lives, in our church, God, especially in our church, we pray for your direction. We pray for your will to be done. God, we pray for love to reign supreme. That we would love each other, that we would serve you. God, in everything that we would do, that your love would be at the center of everything that we do. God, mold us into your image. Allow us to know of your transforming love, your transforming power. And may we be bold enough to step into the new ways that you are working in our lives. We give you thanks for this day and this time of worship. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Friends, we continue uh, this time of, of worship and prayer. So we invite you uh, to bring your offerings uh, to the altar. We also invite you uh, to uh, light a candle as a prayer 
as a way of praying for each other and for our world. But we ask that uh, you continue in this time in an attitude of prayer.
now invite any kids that are here to meet Miss Austin in the back uh, for Children's Church. And we invite Reed Shell to come and be our bicentennial speaker. Good morning. Good to see you all on this last Sunday in the month of May. I want to start with by reading from the Paul's letter to the church in Rome. And just a reminder, this is a letter to people that Paul did not know. He'd spent time in Corinth, he'd spent time in Philippi, he'd spent time in other places, but Rome, at least what scholars tell us, Rome was a place he did not know yet. He hadn't been there. He hoped that he would get there, but he, but he hadn't been there yet. So he's writing to people that don't know him in order to present himself and his thoughts. As this letter comes late in Paul's life, it's sort of a culmination. We've always thought of it as sort of the, uh, the, uh, his magnum opus letter. It was the culmination of things that he had said before, but he's had time for them to sort of simmer and to grow within him and to shape him. So he's writing to this church, and he wants to lay out what his theological thoughts have been now for a number of years, and sort of where they have come down to. So he's talking about some core issues, and then I'm going to read from the 12th chapter, and, and he's talking about basically sort of the, the ethics of the, of the life of the church. So hear these words from the letter to the Romans, 12th chapter, beginning with the ninth verse. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo another, one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty but associate with the lowly and do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves. Leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, and here he's quoting from Proverbs 25. If your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is God's Word for all of God's people. Thanks be to God. Well, I want to begin by expressing uh, appreciation to the Bicentennial Committee for uh, daring to include me in the, in the invitation to come and preach at the worship service. Uh, it is a good thing to be back here to Keith, which is where I grew up. Uh, grew up more in the sanctuary because this building did not exist. So we didn't have contemporary in the way that we've understood contemporary these days. But I celebrate with you the fact that you've had a vital life together for 200 years, and that is no small feat to accomplish, especially in this day and time with the pressures that are on the Christian faith, and churches as institutions as a whole. I doubt very seriously that anybody in those early camp meetings down at Cedar Springs Campgrounds or in that log cabin church 
in the 1800s could envision what Keith Memorial has become. In fact, they didn't even know where the next church was going to be, my guess is, at that time, until the Keith folk donated this land. Uh, and I lived on the very edge uh, of, of the Keith Plantation, grew up there off Keith Lane, and attended City Park Elementary, which was a cornfield, from what I've understood, at one point for the plantation. Uh, and then also had an opportunity to attend Athens Junior High in its initial, its inaugural year, because my dad had been on the school board and I wanted to give it a try, uh, see if the building leaked. Uh, it didn't, even though it was round. We'd never seen anything like that. Everything was, you know, right angle, square. And here we had this round junior high that I could see out my back porch. Uh, and so I attended there for a year as well. And then when I. And I did put desks together. My dad felt like I didn't need to be idle one summer. And the Brunswick Company was putting these desks together for the junior high and he got me employed uh, with the Brunswick outfit coming in and so we were putting nuts and bolts to these che these desks that were I don't know if they're still using them or not that's been a long time ago uh, but uh, <laughs> good I'm glad they held up I'll take credit for some of that uh, uh, but that's, that was where I grew up. I mean, that was the soil out of which, and this church was the soil out of which I was nurtured. So I'm glad to be back here. I feel privileged to have even had just a small part. I volunteered in the church. I was a volunteer youth worker for a few years when I was in and out uh, of town with college and, and did some work there before I finally left. Uh, about I guess it was 1972 when I headed off to Emory and Henry. Uh, uh, college to finish up my bachelor's work and then moved on from there um, and been a part of the Holston Conference officially since about 1976 when I was ordained a deacon in the old two-step process um, and then was an uh, ordained elder shortly thereafter and have been, been involved with the, the Holston Conference and been around the Holston Conference. Uh, so I but I, I, I do appreciate this place, as Melissa alluded to, in our household there was no discussion on Saturday night about where we would be on Sunday morning unless somebody was running a fever or we were on vacation. We would be here. My father was the Sunday school secretary and there was a little breezeway uh, area where the pastor's offices were as well and they had this huge chalkboard up on the wall and all of the information from the Sunday schools would feed into that locale, and Daddy and whoever else was working there would chart all the numbers on there, and that was our record uh, each Sunday. And he did that for as long as I can remember uh, when I was growing up. And then he was a part of a group, a planning group, uh, for building uh, uh, an extension which became a youth Sunday school classrooms, uh, more worship space where we had UMYF and we had a gymnasium. And I thought we had arrived as a church when we finally had a gymnasium. We'd go up to, in to Insminger Hall and we'd tape out Foursquare on the, on the floor and that was kind of our games, but we didn't have any place else to go except unless it was outside. But then we, we built this gym, uh, and it was a great day, uh, and I'm glad to see we had some refreshments in there just a little while ago. Glad to see it's still a part uh, of the life of the church. It was part of what John Wesley would call the means of grace, worship, communion, scripture study, prayer. Those are parts of the elements of the life of this church where I was nurtured and where I grew. Going, going back into the sanctuary this morning, I told the folks in there, I said, 
it, it, I really don't have to close my eyes. I can still see images of people that I remember from years ago. The cadre of ushers that were there week in and week out. I could almost name some of the places where people sat in pews. My family sat over in the transept. and As best I remember, there were met hard metal chairs or something of that version. Now they've got nice cushiony chairs which felt a lot better, quite frankly. Um, but that, that was just part of our life with this congregation. Uh, when I was thinking about being here this Sunday, I began to go back to my copy of the, of the book that was put together for the 160th celebration. And just began to flip through some of the pages and, and it brought back a lot of memories of of names of people and people that I knew, uh, all the, the pastors uh, that I grew up starting in the 50s and moving forward, uh, their families. Uh, I went to school with some of the, some of the people that were, that were PKs, uh, whose father had served this church, uh, and then got to know, was in seminary with some that would later serve this church as senior pastors. And, and knew probably the whole string of, of group of pastors that have ever served this church and knew something about their families. So I've remained connected, even if in a very loose way, to Keith Memorial for uh, all, all these years that have been a part of it. I remember standing and freezing outside for the uh, live nativity scene that was started many years ago. And I, I know it's a struggle to get folks to come, but... You know, that, that really was significant. I, I am not seeing that as much with churches. For a while, we went through that era where, where a lot of lived, did a live nativity. They didn't just go out and buy a mannequin. They had, they had flesh and blood out there, which was really what the story of that first nativity was about. It was flesh and blood. It wasn't a, ma a mannequin. And I remember one of my last youth outings. It was before I left to go to Emory and Henry. In fact, we were at uh, Wesley Woods. And I left there before the rest of the group did because I was leaving at about 6.30 the next morning to go to Emory, Virginia uh, to enroll at Emory and Henry. But we took a hike. We went into Cades Cove and took a hike to Abrams Falls. And one of our youth, took that literally and thought they were supposed to fall, I guess, and they did. So we had to hustle and get the park rangers and we carried one of our youth out of Abrams Falls in one of these basket stretchers. And I'll never forget, I don't know the man's name, but there was a, I think he was a retired New York police officer who took a turn. carrying that stretcher back to the parking area so that we could get this person uh, uh, some first aid and find out if, if they were okay. Uh, and that, that's a memory that's etched for me for a long time. But I know that nostalgia can bring comfort and can be a reminder of things important to us, but I'm also aware that your memories are different. Your experiences are different. I've been away from here. I shouldn't have counted it up this morning while I was sitting there because it dawned on me I've been gone for about 50 years, half a century. I felt a lot older than I did when I got out of the car in the parking lot this morning uh, when that realization sort of hit me. But I know your memories are different than mine. I, I, was, I was here in a particular era of the church. And you now are in a particular era of the church. But hopefully, our common ground is the fact that we, are doing, that we were and you are now doing life together. Very similar thing that was part of the prayer concerns this morning. Life. Doing backflips. My granddaughter's still trying to master the 
handspring, back handspring. She's not anywhere in your category right now, but she's working on it. I expect she'll get there at one point. But, but, but that's, that's who we are as the church. It's doing life together. Talking about the things where we do suffer from time to time. Talking about the fact that there will be death that we will experience in families. But there's also going to be life. There's going to be weddings and anniversaries. I was there the day that Sean and Heather got married. I officiated. They didn't own a golf course then. They had more money. Well, no, you didn't have any more money, did you? No, you didn't. You were broke. Two young kids. But that's what we do as a church, isn't it? We do life together. That's one of the strengths to me of any church. And I am obviously biased toward the United Methodist Church. So I could reminisce for a little bit with you, but I'm also aware that we feel pressures of the future. And you've heard some of those pressures mentioned today. And I assure you that I am keenly aware of this pressure that's on the church. I became a district superintendent when we were closed down for the COVID-19 pandemic. And we lived through that, and we had to administer the protocols for getting open back up, and, uh, and, and my phone rang with people saying, can we do this, can we do this, can we do that? Well, no, you can't because it brings you face to face. And then we no sooner emerged, started to emerge from COVID-19, and the word became disaffiliation. And so for a good bit of, of the rest of my time as a superintendent, I was dealing with 60 some odd churches in the Chattanooga area, all of them with questions about what's happening. And now here we are. The new word is disassociation. Melissa will give you good pastoral leadership in navigating this. But these are hard decisions for an organization. These are hard decisions for a church to grapple with because you're talking about the very fabric of your church life. And those are hard to do. We seem to be at a crossroad. Someone described it as a liminal time period. And as I understand that terminology, it just basically means we know what we've been before. We think we know what we are now. We don't know and we haven't arrived in what's going to be in the future. So we're trying to navigate that and we, we feel the tension. If somebody would just give us the answer, but, but nobody can do that. We're going to be figuring that out each church, each local church. We'll have that opportunity to figure that out. Well, uh, some of my thinking about the church has been shaped not only by Scripture, but also by a television program. It aired for about 11 years uh, in the 80s and then into the early 90s. I think they're going to have some, some words up here. Now, you may have to be of a certain age to remember this particular program. Uh, if you were born after the early 80s, you may not have ever remembered it uh, before, but you may have heard about it. I don't know that it's in syndication. Maybe it is. Who, who knows? But anyway, it was the program was Cheers, and it was about a bar in Boston that I understand from friends who have traveled to Boston. You as a tourist, you can still kind of go by the Cheers bar, I guess. But, but I think it was significant. And they had a theme song uh, that was played every week, and quite frankly, I think it, it, it goes well with the church. Now, I was only prepared, somebody told, they told me that they had all the lyrics, I was only prepared to give you a short version and the chorus, 
Because I think that'll capture most of that. So I'm, I'm going to go with my version, and they'll put up there whatever they want to put up, uh, since I don't control them back there anyway. So here we go. It says, making your way in the world today takes everything you've got. Taking a break from all your worries sure would help a lot. Wouldn't you like to get away? All those nights when you have no lights and the check is in the mail and your little angel hung the cat up by its tail and your third fiancé didn't show, sometimes you want to go where everybody knows your name and they're always glad you came. You want to be where you can see our troubles are all the same. You want to go where everybody knows your name. And quite frankly, that's one of the things I tried to do in ministry across the years was at least to be able to identify a person and call them by name. Now, I didn't do it perfectly. There were folks I missed. But I worked at it. Because I thought it was important. I know it was important for me to be called by my name. So I assumed it was important for somebody else to be called by their name. And cheers was a way that helped me Imagine that. So the New Testament, as well as a, a story about a bar. Because I suspect people who go to bars are hungry for social connection. They just do it a little differently than we do sometimes in the church. And I think that the, the church needs to be a place where people know your name. Where you can feel connected. We need recognition. We need somebody to see us. Because when we get out into the world, sometimes we just get bruised and battered. But we want to come someplace that knows who we are, that at least recognizes us, and knows us that this place is where they can be. Well, I think the church is one of those unique places that offers social connection. I, I know you can go a lot of places and have social connection these days. I drove in, came off the interstate this morning, drove in through downtown. I hadn't been downtown in a number of years, and it seemed like I passed something and I caught a glimpse of Something that said social connection. I don't know, it's, it's, it was down there. Maybe I misread it. But I thought, okay, that's an establishment that wants you to come and sort of gather around there. Well, isn't that what this church is about? I want you to come so you can gather. You can be here. You can be recognized, not be in, invisible out in the world. What was one of the first issues that God addressed in creation? It's right there in the Bible. Did you get my notes from this sermon? <laughs> she went to the first service. Oh. That's exactly right. Genesis 2.18. It's not good for man, and we'll say that generically now. Now, they, the, the Genesis writer may have may have meant man, me, male, but, but in our day and time, we understand that to be mankind. It's not good that man should be alone. So the creative family, right there in paradise now, from the very beginning, you got light, you got dark, you got food, you got water, you got all these animals, but this is the one where humanity comes into the picture, right there in paradise. Now, I'll quickly follow that up by saying you only have to go a few more verses and you find out how we humans mucked it up when you get to Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel. But that tells us that our human relationships are going to be a struggle at times. It's not something that's a bowl full of cherries. It's tough. 
It is tough to be connected to one another because we're not all the same. Didn't Jesus focus on relationships? He reached out and He touched people that were considered untouchable. Lepers. People would cross the street. The Pharisees would cross the street so as not to be there. The lepers had to call out, leper, leper, leper. How would you like to have to go down the main street in Athens and shout out whatever your weakness or frailty or disease might be so that people could avoid you? Well, that's what a leper had to do. Or Jesus reached out to children that were considered to be on the bottom rung of the socioeconomic ladder. They weren't particularly significant. And He reached out to women. And that was sort of taboo in His own time. Jesus was about relationships. In 2023, the Surgeon General of the United States, Dr. Vivek Murthy, put together a report that was issued under the title, Our Epidemic of Loneliness and Isolation. It was brought to his attention that this was a concern. He wasn't real sure about it, so he launched into a cross-country listening tour, he said. And lo and behold, he found out that he spoke to people across age ranges and socioeconomic backgrounds, and they told him that there were times they felt isolated, invisible, and insignificant. And then he did his own research, and he came up with, the, with statistics that said that Loneliness is associated with greater risk of cardiovascular disease, dementia, stroke, depression, anxiety, and premature death. To quote the report, the mortality impact of being socially disconnected is similar to that caused by smoking up to 15 cigarettes a day. And he closes his opening remarks with, this, with, with these remarks before the body of the report. Loneliness and isolation represent profound threats to our health and well-being, but we have the power to respond by taking small steps every day to strengthen our relationships and by supporting community efforts to rebuild social connection. We can meet the moment together. That sounds almost like it could be written about the church. I have become uh, a fan of Dr. Bruce Perry. Dr. Perry is a child psychiatrist. And he has spent a good bit of his career working with children who have been traumatized. He worked with surviving children that came out, uh, that were released uh, from the Davidian, Branch Davidian compound in Waco, Texas. Among others, he worked with a young boy who had been kept in a dog kennel for a period of time, so much that the kid had very little verbal skills and lived a pretty rough life. And that became, working with that child became the title of one of his books, and the title is The Boy Who Was Raised as a Dog. And then he's worked with children who have been victimized or have witnessed domestic abuse and violence. And from his experience that spanned at least a couple of decades, if not more, he says that the most traumatic aspects of all disasters involve the shattering of human connections. Recovery from trauma and neglect also is about relationships. Rebuilding trust, regaining confidence, returning to a sense of security, and connecting to love. And here's a quote from his book. Relationships are the agent of change, and the most powerful therapy is human Love. That's from a psychiatrist.
Why is the church not saying that? Isn't the church in the love business? Isn't this church in the love business? The Apostle Paul thinks you ought to be. Jesus surely thought so. And I hope you can go find Scripture references that would give evidence of that. And I think the church, this church, and every church in the Holston Annual Conference should be and ought to be in the love business. Because it didn't originate with us, it, it, it may have more originally came from a fellow called Jesus of Nazareth. And really and truly, it didn't start with Him. It really started with the Creator of the universe. My guess is if we took a poll in here, and I know you're all doing a survey, but I guess if we took a a random poll in here and I ask you to characterize God, most likely the majority of answers are going to be God is love. Aren't we in... The love business? Isn't that our mandate? To be stewards of loving work? Who else has that mandate? Does the civic club? Probably not. Does the country club? No. Does city government? (laughs) Are you kidding me? Does county government? Does the federal government? You won't find it in any of the documents. Any of the bylaws. Doesn't the church still have the very message for which the soul of humanity cries for? And I would admonish you if you don't think we do, then please go back and start to read the book again. This one. That's how I learned it. Learned it from being loved and loving others as well. You can call me naive. I'll even call myself naive that I would even believe that Jesus had, has, and will have for all times the best prescription for what ails the human soul and the human family. Genuine, persistent, faithful love that in the words of Paul endures all things, bears all things, makes it through the worst of all things. It is the balm of our wounds and the hope for our future. Uh, Josh asked me to let the musicians know they can come on, start making their way back up here now. No, No, we will not do it perfectly. We won't do it perfectly. But if we fail to do it at all, we're going to find ourselves in one big mess as a society. And in some ways, we're already feeling that anxiety, quite frankly. But with God's help, we can still make a difference in the lives of people who need to connect in order to break the chains of isolation, alienation, and loneliness. This can be a place where everybody knows your name and they're always glad you came. And that can make a world of difference in a life. You know, 
if you stop and think about it. Of all the ills that have plagued humanity from recorded time, and what remedy did God send us? Love. Stop and think about that for a while. So I hope that with, in another 50 years, many of us won't be here for it, or 100 years or 200 years, I hope there'll be a gathering of people here at Keith Memorial, and I hope it'll still be United Methodist Church, but who will gather together, and once again, they'll remember and they'll hopefully give thanks for those who preceded them in their history, people that were involved, bonded together in ministry and mission and in love, and that made all the difference for the life of this community. I again thank you for the opportunity to come back to my home ground and to be with you for just a little while. May God bless you. Would you stand with us as you're able this morning? Reverend Shell, thanks for being with us. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit, we are one in the Lord, and we pray that all unity may one day be restored, and them know we are Christians by our love, by our love, yes, them know. other we will walk hand in hand we will walk with each other we will walk hand in hand and together we'll spread the news that god is in our land and them know we are christians by our love by our love yes them know we are christians by our love We will work with each other We will work side by side We will work with each other We will work side by side And we'll guard each man's dignity And save each man's pride And they'll know Yes, they know we are Christians by our love. All praise to the Father from whom all things come. And our praise to Christ Jesus, He is only Son. And our praise to the Spirit us one and they'll know we are Christians by our love by our love yes they'll know we are Christians by our love and they'll know we are Christians by our love by our love yes they'll know we are Christians by our Reed, thank you so much for being with us today. Give Reed one more hand for being with us. Always good to have our bicentennial speakers. We are back on our regular schedule next week at 11 o'clock. Uh, this summer we are studying the Psalms. 
We are uh, talking about how the Psalms are uh, good for every season of our life. And uh, we are uh, in the book of Psalms. So uh, if you don't think the Psalms have to do with your life, trust me, they do. All right. So uh, be with us next week at 11 o'clock or at 9 o'clock in the sanctuary. Just a reminder that the church surveys that we are doing are due today. So if you have not done your church survey, if you're a church member, have not done that, go ahead and take a chance there at this uh, uh, exit here on my left. Uh, They're on uh, the bench out there as you leave. Go ahead and fill that out and put it in an envelope as you leave. They are due today as you leave. When did I say they're due? Today, not tomorrow, not yesterday. They are due today. Friends, it's good to worship with you. Have a safe Memorial Day. See you next week. God bless.